that we call it the gateway. <laughs> but she wrote the first code and wrote uh, an RFC describing, you know, it was an internet engineering note, uh, uh, number 30, which described how to build a gateway. So that was, uh, that was Ginny. Uh, there's another gal, uh, except that I can, oh, there we are. I can hardly read this. <laughs> All right, so I, I will it, uh, confess to you that in my advanced age, I wear glasses to read my own handwriting. So I don't know if any of you know Radia Perlman, yes. but Radia yes. is the you know Radia. She's fabulous. She did some fantastic work on routing uh, in the architecture of the net, especially for local area networks. Uh, and there is one other gal, Judy Estrin, who is a well-known serial entrepreneur, but she was in my laboratory at Stanford University testing the first TCP IP implementations, and she had to get up at three o'clock in the morning because the other end of the line was at University College London, and there was an eight or a nine hour time difference depending on which time of year it was. So she got up uh, early in the morning to run some of the t first tests of the TCP IP protocols. She went on to, uh, to be a founder of Bridge Communications. She was the CTO of Cisco. She had three or four other startups. Very, very uh, impressive lady indeed. And her dad was my thesis advisor, just to show you. Everything else was. Now, uh, there was this comment about, this is going to be kind of random, but okay, well, let me you know, just rattle for a bit. That's what old, old guys do now. <laughs> so there was this comment about bad ideas. So Jim Clifton, who, uh, who runs um, the, uh, Gallup, thank you. My chief of staff back there can give this speech back to you. Anyway, Jim was, was trying to explain how bad ideas happen. And he was describing that fast food turned out to be a pretty good idea, right? Because you know, look at McDonald's and all this stuff. So some engineer thought, well, if fast food was good, maybe faster food would be better. <laughs> so he's trying to figure out, how do I deliver the food faster? And he came up with this pneumatic tube thing, you know, those, the, the things that they used to have in the banks, I guess some of them still do with the drive, you know, the drive up cars. <laughs> I wouldn't imagine the shape of the hamburger by the time it gets to the other end of <laughs> this pneumatic tube. Oh, well, so that was a good idea, uh, a bad idea that didn't work. I bet you sure. a lot of you uh, saw Hidden Figures. I sure hope so. If you haven't, shame on you. You've got to go watch it. I mean, there's a lot of horrible prejudice and everything else, but I love the ending. You know? It was the gals that figured out how to use the IBM machine. Now, what was interesting is that my first job out of school was at IBM in 1965. And I will tell you, the first thing they did was to send me to, I'd done an uh, undergraduate degree in mathematics, took every computer class I could at Stanford. But they sent me to systems engineering school, and about half of the people in that class were women. So back in the 1960s, there was a much more egalitarian statistic. And I have wondered over the course of the last, I don't know, 40 years or so, how come you know, we haven't been able to maintain that statistic? And I suspect that there are stories that you can tell that would explain some of that. But I do want to point out that in the early stages of computing, that women were very much part of that story, and certainly um, in my case. What was interesting, though, is that IBM, they made sure that, uh, that uh, they broke you of any bad programming habits you might have already learned. Mm -hmm. And so they would hire history majors and English majors and all this who'd never done any programming at all so they could learn the IBM way first. In my case, I had to undo some of the things I learned. Okay, so there's another big issue here, and part of the reason that we run into problems, I think, uh, with women f not feeling like they're 100% <coughs> is that they don't have enough role models. Well, of course, here you are. You know, so you have uh, a responsibility, uh, from my point of view, to be role models for everybody else who isn't here. <coughs> and I think that's a, an important obligation that you have. In the current state of affairs, we really do need more women who show that they can do what they can do, and they can do it just as well or even better than any guy. And you guys know that better than I do. Now, uh, Holberton School got mentioned in the notes that I got, and I have been a big fan of that school. We even put some money into it. So, so, um, you know, they've done a really great job of drawing women into uh, the computer science space. And there are a bunch of other organizations that I just thought I should mention. You probably know all of them, but just in case. Uh, ACMW, the ACM Women's Group. Uh, there's WITI, Women uh, in Technology International, WITI. 
Uh, how about NICWET, which is an unfortunate acronym because it can be mispronounced, but it's the National Center for Women in Technology. Uh, there's also uh, a State Department uh, initiative, Tech Women, IIE. I don't know what the IIE stands for. Does anybody here know? I have no idea. But in any case, the State Department, sorry? It's United Women's International Oh, thank you. So uh, anyway, they, the State Department is pushing uh, to get more women into high tech. There's another one called Girls in Tech and another one Girls Who Code, and there's more. Uh, if you just look up 